I'd like to welcome to the stage our moderator, Mr. Scott Nathan, Special Representative for Commercial and Business Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask the whole panel to come up. Uh, we may as well have them all uh, join us. So hello, everybody. Uh, hello. Welcome to the first panel of the afternoon session of the Global Entrepreneurship Summit. It's uh, fantastic that you're all here. Uh, as The Voice said, I'm Scott Nathan, the uh, State Department Special uh, Representative for Commercial and Business Affairs. And uh, I oversee, within that office, the State Department's Global Entrepreneurship Program. It's one of the reasons why I'm uh, thrilled to be here. It was great. Uh, to be in the audience today uh, to kick things off uh, with the two presidents and uh, that great selection of entrepreneurs. Um, today's panel uh, is on financing entrepreneurship. And uh, as we heard this morning from President Obama, access to capital is the theme of this year's Global Entrepreneurship Summit. Uh, as President Obama said, about 20% of the uh, participants in this year's summit are investors. They've been handpicked to interact with all of you, the uh, entrepreneurs who make up the rest of uh, the group here, uh, in order to foster that interaction, uh, talk about some of the challenges of financing your businesses, and hopefully make connections that could make the difference in growing and building uh, your business. We have a great panel today who can speak to these issues from personal experience and from what they do with their uh, companies and organizations. Um, they're here to talk about how to take an idea and build it into a business and how to finance it through the growth stage uh, all the way through the complete spectrum of capital financing. We'll discuss that full spectrum. You know, it starts with bootstrapping, angel and seed investment, moves on to the potential for venture capital or private equity, and finally access to public capital markets uh, as well. My background before I joined government about a year ago uh, was in the investment business. For 20 years, uh, I was with an investment fund where we were involved in the complete spectrum of investing, uh, and even beyond the spectrum that we'll be talking about today to a stage that I imagine none of you actually ever wants to get to. We did uh, rescue financing for companies in distress, and I hope uh, none of you ever uh, end up in that position. Uh, but through my experience in the investment business, uh, I developed an appreciation for the challenges but also the opportunities involved as entrepreneurs think about different ways that they can attract capital to grow their business. Um, so let's turn to our panel to talk about that. I'm going to try to uh, give each of our panelists an opportunity to talk about their personal experience and where they've uh, been, what sort of lessons they've learned as they've gone through this spectrum of financing. I'm hoping that after each of the panelists uh, talks for a few minutes, we'll get a chance to have a conversation uh, between all five of them. And then finally, we'll have an opportunity at the end uh, for questions and answers uh, from all of you. So first, uh, I'm going to turn to Julie Hanna. Uh, Julie is a serial entrepreneur and the executive chair of Kiva. Kiva provides a platform for crowdfunded microfinance loans to underserved and low-income entrepreneurs in 86 countries, I think. Um, you're the first stop shop for many entrepreneurs who want to start their business. Kiva is also a business in of itself, an organization that had to think about how to get its own uh, financing. So I'm interested, uh, given both your own experience through the companies you started before Kiva, uh, through thinking about starting Kiva, and then also the business that you conduct in Kiva, how do you think about what the challenges are in getting a business going? Well, it, it's interesting to look at, um, you know, I think maybe a good place to start is, 
In, in Silicon Valley, I think of Silicon Valley as kind of the uh, world's largest petri dish or accelerator. And, and we try out a lot of stuff. We're very experimental. And then when we find things that work, we codify them. And in a way, we try to export them uh, to the world. And, and part, of, part of what I try to do is democratize that knowledge, what's working. Um, and, and certainly with, with, with investment, one of the things that we've uh, become pretty uh, much more refined about are kind of the stages of investment and 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 how it, and it's changed uh, in recent years. On one end of the spectrum, you have kind of tech-driven companies uh, in Silicon Valley. On the other end is the work that Kiva does, kind of really pioneering a crowd lending model uh, with, uh, actually we began in Uganda and uh, with a, the, for our first borrower was a woman named Elizabeth Omala. She was a fishmonger. She sold fish by the roadside. She was a single mother of five children and she was able to support her family but she couldn't afford to send them to school. Um, and what she dreamed about doing was taking the bus to Lake Victoria so she could buy fish directly from the fishermen and cut out the middleman so she could increase her profits. She wanted to buy a small refrigerator uh, so that she could buy larger quantities of fish, and she couldn't afford to do that. And so one loan of $500, crowdfunded by five people, allowed her to begin doing this, and then she began sending her children to school. So I think of Elizabeth as the godmother of crowdfunding. That was in 2005. And, and since then, um, Kiva's crowdfunded 700 loans, uh, $700 million in loans, sorry, uh, and reached 1.6 million people like Elizabeth uh, in 86 countries, um, 250,000 in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, with about $170 million in loans. That's on one end of the spectrum. In, if you look at the bootstrapping that we do in Silicon Valley, there's actually some similarities to people like Elizabeth, which is it fundamentally begins with the belief in the entrepreneur. It's, it starts with the person, and the idea is secondary to that, because we know that virtually everything's going to change, but the entrepreneur is the constant. So it, and it begins based on kind of trust-based relationships. And what we try to do is we try to bootstrap our way to having a product and finding that early stage product market fit. And we're able to do that on little to no capital. What I always say to entrepreneurs is your competition is the 18-year-old kid, and that age goes down all the time, now it's 15, I think, um, who is living on ramen noodles in a cafe and is working on their app until they found traction and product market fit, and then they go get funding. We actually call it ramen capital. So that's the, that's the, that's the competition in Silicon Valley. Now, once that we have product market fit, then the funding cycle starts to accelerate, and we have a, a many ways, even at the angel investing level, that, uh, that, that people get funded. And then crowdfunding has kind of stepped in to be that on-ramp, because you have, more importantly, in fact, that Kiva works. It's no longer unique. There are 1,400 crowdfunding marketplaces in the world today. Um, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, uh, regional ones here. What, what they're very effective at is allowing you um, not only to get your initial capital, but it forces a de-risking of finding your market, uh, finding, uh, uh, figuring out how to position and brand your product all at once. So it really accelerates the product and it allows you to de-risk. So I'll stop there. So before we move on, I just have one uh, quick question for you. I imagine many people in the audience are interested in this. Uh, what advice would you have for entrepreneurs who are making a pitch for a microloan? What kind of criteria do you use, or how should they um, make the pitch in a way that will be successful? Well, it's all about story. I mean, I think that there's a really very simple and profound thing that Kiva discovered, which is we basically took kind of took the principles of micro lending that that had been. Uh, become known to the world uh, by Dr. Uh, Dr. Yunus, who uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006, and brought it online and made it person to person. And it's really that person to person connection of a picture and a story that compels people to want to back the dream of an entrepreneur. So it's really about backing dreams and this, this recognition that we all fundamentally want to be a part of each other's stories. So the more compelling and engaging the story, uh, it's really about sort of what's, what's the vision, what's the dream, and then can I move you to my dream, to want to back my dream, and, and, and so it's the power of storytelling. Great. That's terrific. So let's move on to uh, Ashish Thakar. So you're another serial entrepreneur. Um, you founded the Mara Group and the Mara Foundation. 
uh, building your own ecosystem to support entrepreneurs through banking, investment, and mentorship. In fact, we just hosted you for announcement of a, a great new program from your Mara Mentor online platform. So maybe you can say a few words about that. But before we get into talking about the role of mentorship and how you're broadening that out to a huge population, um, you started your first business when you were 15, as uh, uh, Julie sort of alluded to, um, with a very small amount of money. Um, how did you think about that? How did you get the capital? Um, how, did you, how did you get things going with the early seed capital you had? Thank you, Scott. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm definitely the worst advocate for education, um, being a school dropout. But, uh, <laughs> but my, my story is, you know, my family got kicked out of Uganda in 1972. We moved to England. We started again. In 93, we moved back to Rwanda. And nine months later, unfortunately, me, my sister, and parents were refugees during the genocide in Rwanda. Mm. So we luckily came out alive again, but unfortunately, everything we built from 72 to 93, we lost again in 94. So being a teenager, and I felt like I wanted to and needed to do something about it to support the family. So I quit school at the age of 15. I took a $5,000 loan from three people, and I set up a little business in Uganda. So I understand firsthand what it's like being that young entrepreneur, not having access to capital, and no ability to network or get mentorship <laughs> in the manner in which I needed. So I've been doing this for 19 years as a group, and uh, today Mara's in 22 countries with about 11,000 people. But we set up the Mara Foundation six, seven years ago with the whole thesis of how do we enable, empower, and inspire young entrepreneurs and women entrepreneurs on our continent, and then now going global. And in our opinion, it's three core things that are required in terms of the pillars as a support system. It's not a, it's not a one solution thing. And the three pillars are, firstly, it's informal education. As important as education is, which is extremely crucial, but informal education in form of mentorship is very, very important. How do you get young entrepreneurs and women entrepreneurs the ability to network with entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, in New York, and, and broader, and to learn and get guidance and advice and handholding and support? And Scott, to your earlier point, you know, that's what we've launched on, in, in GES, which is the Mara Mentor Platform for the East African community, where we hope to empower and enable and inspire a million entrepreneurs by 2020, that's great. Um, which is what we've announced here. But mentorship is very crucial. The second piece, which is again to the theme of the summit, which is access to finance. And access to finance, in, in our opinion, comes under two forms. There's debt, and then there's the equity. On the debt front, being on the receiving end of financial services for many years across multiple different countries, multiple different companies, I understand firsthand the challenges. Our bank's typical model has been taking customers' deposits, putting it into government treasury, and not lending to SMEs. We need banks to lend to businesses. So that's a big, big missing piece. And then the other piece is the access to equity. And access to equity comes through venture capital, which is what we need to encourage and foster more of. What the US government has pledged the billion dollars was, yep. is a fantastic start. Uh, there's many other initiatives that Strive and I were on another panel yesterday where the government of Kenya was talking about their Enterprise Kenya initiative. We're launching the Mara Adventure Investments Funds uh, in um, across Africa and hopefully broader uh, very soon. So, you know, the access to capital part is a very crucial one. And the last piece to this whole thing is public policy. Yeah. If we don't have a strong enabling framework and a public policy that actually enables startups and the informal sector to become a part of the formal sector, it's never going to succeed. And it's great to see our heads of state being so passionate about entrepreneurship now. Yes. Along my journey, when I started, that was not the case. The answer to unemployment was foreign direct investment or large projects, whereas today, Governments are realizing that nurturing small and medium enterprises in the true sense is the solution. Well, that's certainly the message of this summit, the um, message that President Obama has been so passionate about. Uh, before we move on, any advice to the entrepreneurs out there about how to use your, your mentorship platform to best grow their business? Yeah. yeah, no, thank you. So Mara Mentor is an application which is available on all app stores. You can download it right now. It's um, it's free to download, it's free to use, and it gives you the ability to network with mentors around the world. It gives you the ability to have peer-to-peer -peer conversations with mentees across Africa and broader. 
The UN is taking this platform globally, so it's nice that it's an African initiative which is truly going global. But it gives you the ability to get guidance, advice, hand-holding, support, training, competitions, asking questions and brainstorming with each other about various different <coughs> sectors across multiple geographies. So it's a great tool and it's absolutely free to use, so please do take advantage of it. Great. So sticking with the uh, early and seed stage uh, of growing a business, I want to turn to Loretta McCarthy. Um, you're the managing partner of Golden Seeds. It's a unique investment group uh, that range, raises angel and early stage capital for women entrepreneurs and women-led companies. Um, as an early stage investor, what do you look for uh, as you sift through all the people who are uh, thinking about growing businesses and looking for capital? Well, I, first of all, I'll say, hello everyone. I'll first of all say that since I am covering the angel investment piece of this panel, um, I am thrilled to say it's one of the most exciting parts of the investment spectrum. And as you know, angel investors are the people that started many of the big brand names we know today, Google, Uber, Facebook, and many others. So angel investing is a really exciting a place to be. Um, and in the United States, uh, they invest about $25 billion a year in 70,000 companies. So, Scott, they go through many thousands of companies and many, many thousands, millions of companies actually to arrive at those. And they, many of these groups and many individual angel investors do have a particular investment uh, thesis. Um, they may invest in particular sectors. They may invest in particular stages. All angels invest quite early but there are there is early and then there is earlier so that they will they all, many of them have a point of view at golden seeds our particular point of view is that we invest in women led companies so the background on that is that in 2004 uh, or 2005 which is the year we started which is really only 10 years ago women were start in the US women were starting about 40% of the businesses but we're getting less than 3% of the capital additionally although there were 200,000 in angel investors in the United States, only 5% of them were women. So those two facts really propelled us to start Golden Seed <coughs> so that there was some group that would be creating the conditions in which these women-led businesses would be serious, seriously considered and, ser and respectfully considered in, in an investing environment since clearly whatever was happening wasn't working for women entrepreneurs at that time. Um, so that's the twist of Golden Seeds. Um, we have been at it now for 10 years. I'm happy to say that 28% of, of angel-backed companies in the United States today are now women, which is really fabulous. That's one out of every four now. And I'm equally happy to say that one out of every four angel investors, and there are about 325,000 angel investors in the U.S. right now, one out of every four of them is a woman. So that combination of, of women entrepreneurs and ensuring that women who are able to participate in this work um, in terms of investing are, are doing so. Part of the magic for Golden Seeds has been uh, ensuring that women and men, a few, quite a few enlightened men who see the merits of doing this, uh, are very, very interested in learning how to be good angel investors. And we see that happening all over the world, um, including here in Africa, where we are sometimes invited to come and actually help train investors on how to do this work. Um, and our belief is the more trained people you have on the ground, the more uh, people will mobilize around groups of entrepreneurs to work with them. For us, it's very simple. If you have investors who are interested in doing this work, in our case, we have over 400 investors who are who are investing alongside of us. If you have people who are really motivated to do this, it is critically important to give them some amount of training that in turn gives them confidence, that in terms gets them engaged with these companies, which is so critically important in all of these cases. I'm so thrilled to hear about the Mara Mentors Program because there is just no substitute for the amount of training that, that um, people and entrepreneurs can benefit from. And back to the investors, if you get them engaged, you then get them writing checks. 
they don't really do that in the absence of all of the rest of that. So that's one of the many reasons we're committed to, to training. Um, just, I just want to make one last point about this summit, and that is that it, 10 years ago when we started Golden Seeds, it seemed it was an unusual thought for a lot of people that you had an angel investment group that was going devoted to focusing only on women-led companies. And it was quite remarkable and completely thrilling to me to see that yesterday, three of the six finalists were women, and today on the stage, uh, two of the three entrepreneurs that were presented were women, which really speaks to the progress women have made. Yeah. I'd also note that um, three of the five panelists are women. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, just before we move on, any quick advice you'd have to women entrepreneurs about uh, how to overcome the, their ch unique challenges? I, I think it was, it's really the same as uh, as with any pitch and any storytelling. You know that that, that <coughs> it's. It's important to always remember when you're pitching anyone for funding to realize that in, in the angel world, it's a very personal gesture when someone writes a check and says, here is my hard-earned money, good luck, and please let me know every once in a while how you're doing, or I want to work directly with you because I really believe in what you're doing. It's very personal, so it's helpful to as an entrepreneur, put yourself in the position of somebody like me, watching your pitch and trying to think, do I want to back that idea and do I want to back that person? Because it's a relationship. It's said, I've heard it said several times in the last day, this is like a marriage. You know, you, it's a relationship that goes on for quite a long time and you really want to be sure that, that, um, that you present yourself as someone that they really want to back. Thanks. So um, now I'd like to turn to Mindy Silverstein, the managing director of the Milken Institute. Uh, we're sort of moving through the spectrum of uh, capital. Mindy's going to talk about uh, capital markets. At the Milken Institute, you focus on what we're really talking about today, access to capital, creating jobs, uh, policies that uh, help strengthen uh, economies. And much of the work that uh, you do at the Institute is around strengthening capital markets and uh, coming up with innovative financial models that help drive uh, investment and development in, in developing regions. Um, you work with global investors. What's their perception of uh, developing regions generally, sub-Saharan Africa uh, specifically, as a place for uh, investment? Um, well, thank you. First, Scott, thank you for having me and to the host uh, governments. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I mean, I think what I would say is um, in my role, I'm actually, I was joking that I've, I'm not an entrepreneur, so I've never started a business. Luckily, we have amazing entrepreneurs on this panel, and I'm not an investor. Luckily, we have that covered. But I do spend a lot of time with global investors, and I think the great thing is they're paying attention. They absolutely are focused on um, not just sub-Saharan Africa, but developing markets in general. Um, in fact, our chairman, Mike Milken, on his first speech on Wall Street in 1969, it was called the best investor is a social scientist. And so right now, all of those investors, or at least the smart ones, are trying to get inside of all of your heads and figuring out what's happening in your regions, you know, where is there gonna be growth, where do they need to be? Um, so that's the great thing. I will say there's, and obviously this is you know, something to say this week with, you know, there was some discussion earlier about the perceptions. Um, there's still a lot of information asymmetry. And, and why does that matter? Well, it matters to investors because they're trying to think about how to price risk. I mean, that is, at the end of the day, what they're thinking about and where they need to be. Um, so there's many types of investors. We have a lot of discussions about, you know, just like you can't categorize 54 African countries that are all very different, you can't say that all investors are the same. They have very, very different appetites, as you're hearing just from this panel. Um, and certainly institutional investors or others are completely different. Um, but I will say that, you know, there still are challenges for, that we hear about from investors sort of across the board. You know, one is, are there structures? So they aren't asking why they need to do it, but they're asking how do they do it? You know, they, there's a lot of interest, but if there aren't the right structures for them to invest in, they aren't gonna do it. Um, also, they need to think about partners and about, you know, really their time and allocation. Can they be making, having a presence in these markets um, when they're, you know, have a large portfolio they need to be managing elsewhere. And so how do they do that? Um, Ashish is someone who talks all the time about um, global and local and, you know, like having uh, the right kind of partnerships. 
Um, and then the last thing is obviously the state of capital markets. And this is because, you know, why do investors care? Because they have to think about exits. And um, investors don't want to go into markets if there isn't liquidity. Um, I think, you know, we did, a, um, we did a paper that said, I think there have been, um, it's like 16 stock exchanges started in the last, since 1990, and it's about a trillion dollars right now. But the fact is, is that we know that there needs to be um, more integration in capital markets because right now the purpose of these, you know, exchanges aren't really, you know, they're not um, serving the purpose because there's not enough, enough liquidity in those markets for investors. So you're um, developing a graduate degree program with the uh, IFC and George Washington University. Um, maybe it's directed toward filling the need you just identified, but can you talk a little more about how that a program will uh, be developed and what it might do for uh, the entrepreneurs who are looking for capital? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's been mentioned a few times here, and uh, President Obama mentioned you know, human capital and the piece of that in terms of attracting capital. And so one of the things that we found, as I just <coughs> mentioned about the exchanges and the development, um, you know, we looked at all the graduate programs around the world, and they're really training people to go work in London and Hong Kong. They're not really training people to go and develop the capital markets in you know, Kenya, Rwanda, Ghana, you know, and regions that really need to have specific expertise. Um, and so we're working with the IFC in partnership with them and with George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Um, to develop a capital markets uh, curriculum and it will be eventually a degree program, hopefully in the next few years. And the idea is that we'll be training, um, you know, up and coming, you know, sort of the, the, the future leaders in finance ministries, um, central banks, um, you know, the capital markets authorities, other institutions like that, and also some people in the private sector um, so that you're enhancing and increasing the level of human capital. Thanks, Mindy. And uh, finally, let's move on to Strive, Strive uh, Maziawa. So um, we've heard about different stages of uh, the capital cycle. Uh, you're, you're the founder and executive chair of a business, Econet, that uh, has participated in practically all stages uh, of capital raising uh, for your business. Um, what does the landscape for raising capital in Africa look like based on your experience and your uh, very broad perspective that you have? Well, th thank you. It's great to be here and to see so many friends. Um, you know, next year I will have been in business for 30 years. Um, I was 25 years old working as a telecommunications engineer for a state-owned telephone company in Zimbabwe uh, when I quit my job and went and became an entrepreneur. I managed to raise seven, the equivalent today of $75. <laughs> and um, when I listened to some of the conversations going on about access to capital today, I feel I want to cry. <laughs> Because you talk about banks, <laughs> you talk about banks, I couldn't even make my way to the door. Yeah. Uh, governments, well, we were preaching socialism and uh, other ideologies in my day, and uh, it was not easy. But it's never easy. It is always the same, really. So let me say that. And you all come from different countries, so I can't be prescriptive. I can only share with you some of my personal experiences. You know, I went th I've been through the entire spectrum. The only thing I've not done is crowdfunding because it came after my time, but I saw my daughter raising money crowdfunding the other day with, for a social <coughs> enterprise, and she managed to get something out of me for it. <laughs> but, um, you know, I've dealt with banks. I've, gone through the various stages of dealing with banks. I've dealt with venture capital. I've dealt with capital markets. I've listed a company. Um, I've dealt with private equity and, and the rest of them. So what can I give you to take away different time, different generation? You know, this is what I learned about access to capital. If you're an entrepreneur, make it part of your entrepreneurship. 
it, raising money is not an event. It's a process in which you are constantly learning and you're having to be constantly innovative. And there is, there's no prescription. Yes, we've got titles for them, venture capital and crowdfunding and all these things, and it's nice. But you know, the core thing is, if you have an idea and you're passionate about what you want to do, and you have got to be tenacious as well, you, you've got to figure out, sometimes you, uh, the vision is not, for, is not that same day. You know, for example, I, I knew I wanted to build a big company. We all do. But with $75, you can't do much, even in those days. Maybe it had the buying power of slightly more than it has today. But you know, you've got to be just innovative, tenacious. Yes, I, I borrowed from friends and cousins, but I always made sure I paid them back. I went one day to, my, to a supplier, and I said to him, I've come to, I need to see you. Uh, and he said, why? I said, can I come and see you? And I arrived and I said, you know, I'm not gonna be able to, to pay you at the end of this month. <coughs> And he said, but that's two weeks away. I said, I came to tell you that I won't be able to pay you. And he said, when, when, when will you be able to pay me? I said, I don't know. Maybe two weeks later. But I needed you to know I, want, I, can't, I can't pay you. So he said, sit down. Nobody has ever done this. So I'm gonna do you a favor. I'll give you terms. You know, so he started to supply me. That was access to capital. You see how you relate my integrity became the capital. Your integrity is better capital than any bank will ever give you here. You've got to learn to use it. You don't run away from your creditors. You don't run. If you took some supply from somebody, you go and you pay them. I turned that to capital. And I worked with those suppliers. One day they worked for me. Thank you. So that's a, a great note to finish the uh, initial round of comments on. Thank you very much for that strive. Uh, I'd now like to see if we could get a conversation going. I think one of the things that uh, people may want to hear about is how should they know as they build their business what is the appropriate stage of capital? How do they know where they're ready for VC or private equity or public markets debt or equity? So as we continue this conversation, I'd love to be able to see if there's any advice we could give. But I think Julie had a comment on what Strive just uh, said. So. Yeah, I just think it's um, really worth underscoring um, what you so beautifully articulated, because it's something we uh, not only talk about, but we obsess about in Silicon Valley. We talk about trust-based networks, and that the, really the foundation of everything before you even think about capital and raising money is establishing trust and credibility. And, and integrity is such a, such a vital part of that. Um, because when you have those trust-based relationships, and we have this very highly efficient network effects uh, in Silicon Valley that are, are we live and die by our reputation, the trust that we establish with each other, we're very open in the way that we share information. So if someone comes to me pitching me for an investment, I can, I'm usually one or two people away from being able to talk to trusted peers about that person. Uh, and so this is really, the, the, the integrity of the system kind of depends on that, and, and we all know that we live and die by it. So it is such a foundational element of this, and we've codified it again. Um, we know it's kind of part of the secret sauce of, of, of how we work with each other, and we honor it, and, and we do live and die by it. So I just, I just wanted to underscore what you articulated so, so beautifully, because it, it speaks to the universality of this, regardless of what stage you're at or what, you're, what business you're in. Thanks, Julie. That's great. Mindy, did you want to uh, add? 
Um, so, so I just wanted to comment that build on um, <coughs> Strive talked about. You know, there's there's sort of this constant. Um, you have to constantly be thinking about. You know, when I when I was thinking about. The, t the portion of the spectrum you want to talk about exits, I mean, you have to be thinking about strategy throughout. And I think that, um, you know, we actually did a survey recently, um, you can download it on our website, but it's actually about U.S. Um, financing as, uh, small businesses in the mid-market. But it was a comprehensive survey, and I think it would speak to anyone. Obviously, all entrepreneurs, their first preference is to self-finance. The second option is banks and debt because they don't want to give up equity. And so I think you know, it is thinking about what is your, going to be your strategy throughout. Are you going to want to stay in the business? And I think certainly most of the entrepreneurs I meet in Africa, they, you know, most of them aren't thinking about wanting to give up a huge amount of equity in their company. Um, so those are things you have to think about. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to bring up is um, you know, multinationals, I, I meet a lot of you know, I actually talk in, in terms of the perception reality. I tell entrepreneurs, I'm sorry, I tell investors all the time that there are over 500 companies in Africa that have over $100 million in revenue a year. I mean, that's what investors are interested in. They're like, how do I grow those companies? Because they're not so small, you know, big investors, they're not going to necessarily go in earlier stages. Um, they want to find those companies, um, but it's, you know, how do they do that? And I think it's very interesting that, you know, your partnerships and your relationships with multinationals, I work with several multinationals that they have their venture arm and they're investing. That's actually part of how they're getting exposure in these markets. As I said earlier, they know they need to be in these markets. So it's a way that they're getting some exposure. They're starting to invest in companies. They may want to acquire you at some point. They may want to just continue to partner with you, but it is a way, um, you know, in terms of partnership. Great. Strive, did you have something you wanted to You know, to, to, to your question as to when, when do you know wh what type of financing you need, let the business tell you. You have to listen to the business itself. If, so, you know, at a certain stage in, in, in my business, I got to a place where the business needed more capital. The kind of financing I need, I couldn't get it from the, from the banks. It was the business telling me what it needed. It was just like when I left my home country 15 years ago and moved to South Africa. I was beginning to do uh, regional and international expansion. I needed access to capital markets that were much deeper. Each time I went to a Zimbabwean bank, they said, do you want to take all the money in all the banks here? Uh, because I needed deeper markets. And you know what? Five years ago, I moved to London. I needed even deeper access to markets where I can say, I need to raise one and a half billion dollars this month for this project. The bankers in South Africa said, whoa, we need to talk to the guys in London. So I said, okay, I'll move to London. You have to listen to the business. Um, I just want to say that uh, one of the things that is, is clear with many entrepreneurs is that they are often experts in what they do, and they may not be finance experts, and they may not know all the variations of the types of financing they can get but they really can surround themselves with great advisors who can help them. And uh, a mentoring program such as Mara Mentors can be very useful there. It, it, I will say one tip to all entrepreneurs is surround yourself with really smart people who are willing to give of their time. And it is absolutely remarkable how much time people will give you uh, of their, of the, with, even if they are not investors in your business. Because thinking through these investment options at an early stage, I think it's such wise advice to say, think about, he, listen to the business and, and think about what the business is requiring. Um, it's also important to understand as you consider an offer for capital or a loan or whatever it may be, think of the consequences of that for your business. And sometimes there are unintended consequences or unanticipated consequences if you haven't thought a little bit down the road to think about what does that really mean for my business. It is actually okay to think about not seeking outside funding, and that's really a serious option that you, all entrepreneurs should at least consider in the early stages. How far can I get this on my own without 
bringing in financing partners. And there are definitely are companies that get all the way through to maturity without having to do that. And we also have companies come to apply to us at times because they think they should be in the market asking for funding. And we will sometimes give them advice that we think they just don't need it or come back to us at a later point if you are at a point where the, mar your, the market of your company is telling you you really need deeper pockets here. Ashish? Yeah, just a few points. I mean, I couldn't agree more with Strive in terms of integrity. And my, my father used to always tell me, he said, you know, make money with your partners, not from your partners. And I think it's a, it's a really important point. But also, I think the other point to emphasize in terms of when, when do you need what type of capital, I think you've got to remember that entrepreneurship is truly a journey. It's not a destination. So it's something that you've got to be patient in. I mean, Strive's been at it next year. It's going to be 30 years. I've been at it next year. It's going to be 20 years. This is a long-term journey. So don't try and rush. The mistakes I see a lot of entrepreneurs make is they get into this whole ego thing of, you know, what is my neighbor doing and what is that guy doing? And I want to quickly, I want to do it bigger than him and better than him and quicker than him. And, and just, and you know, one, one philosophy that I have is just never get into that rat race. Because if you get into that rat race, even if you win, you're still a rat. So, so stay away from that whole philosophy. I like that. So I think go with your own pace, start up your own business, be ambitious, dream. And as Africans, this is our time to dream. This is our time globally. This is our time as Africa. So absolutely dream, but take your time. Our time's not going away anytime soon. We are the last frontier, so we're going to be here for a very long time. So don't rush it. Go step by step, but have a proof of concept. And I think Loretta's point was very true that put yourself on the other side of the table, that if you had the luxury of having that capital, would you invest in yourself at that stage? Do you have enough proof of concept, et cetera? This, that's really, really important. But I want to throw one question to you, Loretta, in terms of, You've worked with a lot of entrepreneurs in North America, particularly. The access to capital, most obviously, this is a global entrepreneurship summit. So most of the participants were African. So, obviously, in Africa, you know, the access to capital generally is a challenge, and it's a global thing. But how much of it is it a, cha is it a challenge in North America? Is it as tough? Is it how tough is it? I, I think it is. Uh, there is more available capital. I think crowdfunding is also taking on momentum uh, in North America. That we, I think is still actually a small part of the capital markets, but it, it's very. It will be very interesting to see where it goes over time. Um, there are 225 angel investment organizations in the United States. So there, I, I would say that there are definitely places to go that our angel organization and others, that some of which we've heard about here, um, that, that, are, that are very interested in hearing about new businesses. Um, and there are def many individuals who do not participate through those angel investment organizations who do get very involved with, with individual entrepreneurs on their own. So I, I think that increasingly the world of what we were calling here angel investing has become a profession, has become a whole industry that actually is taking on uh, much more maturity in the United States, but far beyond the United States. We're very aware of, uh, there are people here from EBAN, the U European Business Angel Network. There are people here from many other angel networks that are at this summit. Um, and those organizations have actually be taken on levels of sophistication in terms of how they do their work and how they work with entrepreneurs that is hopefully benefiting everyone. That's great. So uh, I'm going to let Julie make a comment, but we're going to move very soon to um, Q&A. There will be microphones uh, coming around. I don't think there are fixed microphones, but think of your questions and uh, in a moment uh, get your hand up. So uh, we'll get it. Julie. I just thought it might be useful to distinguish between um, debt capital and equity capital. So what, what Loretta is speaking about is, is um, equity. Uh, based capital and uh, you know Silicon Valley has a perception of having money flowing down the th streets and and uh, you know the US um, being a far easier place to raise capital that is uh, true and it's not true because what, what's interesting that's happened is because this is a 
a fairly mature market is the bar for raising capital is higher than it, I've ever seen it in my 20 years uh, of building companies and investing in them. So it's much harder to get access to that capital than it's ever been. The company has to be that much further along with that many more proof points. Uh, and so this is the interesting thing about the equity side of investing. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, if you look at the, the debt side of things, uh, bank lending has dropped 44 percent since 2008, the Great Recession, uh, to small business loans. Eight out of ten businesses get rejected daily. Uh, so you've, that's billions of dollars that have been eviscerated. It's taken out of the, the market. So small businesses in the U.S. Um, have, have a difficult time getting access to capital. And what's moved in is is crowdfunding. And, and I call it kind of the world's bank. It's sort of a system by the people, for the people. It leverages the wisdom of the crowds. Uh, and that's moved in to really bridge that gap where debt capital has, has not been available and where equity capital is, is hard to reach. And, and it's democratizing access to capital globally. That's a very, very interesting perspective. Um, let's move to questions. Uh, if you uh, raise your hand high, I have some chance of seeing it. We have a question uh, over here in red. Um, you, why don't you wait till the microphone comes? It's uh, headed your way. Please, when you uh, ask a question, and let's make sure that they are questions, uh, quick questions, just uh, state your name and where you're from. OK. Uh, my name is Tanya Tomei from Mozambique. Mm -hmm. um, I am the executive business and investment director of, well, <laughs> an investment company. <laughs> Um, in Mozambique, 98% uh, of our companies are SMEs. And the SMEs had a challenge um, to be organized, have the accounts organized, mm -hmm. had the challenge to have business plans. So training and mentorship, they are really, really important. Mm -hmm. Not only supply or give alternative ways of funding. Um, and my first question is, how could we build, build debt in a market, in a, uh, in a market that is not uh, well developed uh, as our capital market? That practically to equity, they they don't they don't okay. have how to exit. Okay, got it. So, and who would like to uh, take that question? Anybody want to jump in there about uh, how to develop? Uh, I, I would like to know more but, about how crowdfunding is regulated. Okay. This could be an alternative Angle. for us That's because Angle. credit has interest rates very right. high. Anybody want to jump in on that? I can speak quickly yeah. to the crowdfunding question. Yeah. So, you know, the, it's an excellent question. And again, equ for equity crowdfunding, you've got a, a, a regulatory issue. We passed the Jobs Act in the, in the U.S. last year, um, and it's still, um, it's still kind of a, a pretty nascent market. Um, you have AngelList, which is kind of the, one of the, the first uh, of, of its kind. Um, it, it's going to depend on country by country in terms of how equity-based crowdfunding is regulated. For, for if you look at things like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, they're, they're altruistic, project-based, so you don't get paid back, right? You get paid in product. If the, if the, if the project fails and doesn't deliver, there's no uh, consequence. So th these things don't have as much of a, they're not as complex as an equity-based crowdfunding model would be. In, in my experience in the investment business, as the crowdfunding model gets rolled out throughout different countries, the capital markets regulatory framework, the Securities and Exchange Commission equivalent from the United States and every other market, um, there are some unintended consequences and uh, wrinkles that really need to be ironed out in the way that capital markets are regulated and how that, that, how that maps onto crowdfunding. So it, it requires a lot of work by uh, government uh, regulatory agencies to make sure that they're not putting restrictions uh, in the crowdfunding model that make it not work, but also still protect investors. I mean, this is the, the delicate balance. Strive, did you want to uh, add something? Yeah. I don't often like to talk about what governments should do. But, um, you know, there, there are really two issues there. There's more than $8 billion worth of investments were done by private equity funds in Africa last year, a record. There's a wall of money from private equity funds. But it will do like this around Mozambique because there aren't enough big business, bigger businesses to fund. 
and private equity is looking for bigger projects to fund. So what, what needs to happen is more work needs to be done on the mobilization of domestic capital within the country, both, for, both on the debt side as well as on the equity side, including government-supported funds, including uh, programs on venture capital, even impact investing, to try and accelerate the growth of, of those small enterprises. Thank you. That's great. I think there was a question over here. Oh, M Mindy. Um, I was just, um, just going to give a little bit more on that. Um, I'm definitely not an expert in capital markets, but in terms of private equity, I mean, the costs of that are very high for entrepreneurs. Um, and global private equity, as Strive was saying, I mean, they are looking for big deals. They're looking for very high returns. And they sometimes have very short time frames. So um, that doesn't necessarily match up with the kinds of projects or the, you know, what, what people actually need. Um, and, and that actually is driven by their investors, you know, their, um, their LPs, their limited partners who are coming in and want to get money out of the fund. Um, so, so they're driven by that. Um, and then I'll say in terms of the public markets, um, you know, transitioning and doing an IPO is very expensive. And, and right now, um, again, I'm not the expert on this, but I think we feel that the state of capital markets aren't really, isn't really serving the purpose. I mean, if it's an exchange that has just a few companies on it, it's not going to be getting investors the liquidity that they want. So then your options are to go to a bigger market, and then it's even more expensive. Um, you know, the capital requirements and other things are much higher. So until you have, obviously, a much bigger business um, and it's growing to a significant size, um, I don't know that those are the best options. I do know we're, that's why we're trying, certainly as our organization and working in partnership with many others, to look at how do you deepen and strengthen and integrate or at least make um, capital markets more compatible. Thanks. There was a question over here. I think it was you who I called that. Yeah. If I can just add something there, it's not an accident that a lot of the a lot of that huge investment is going to those countries which have very active, strong stock exchanges, like Kenya. Because here you see businesses that are growing very quickly and become attractive to investment. So these are the things you need to lobby for. You need to have your stock markets properly set up, regulated, so that your local businesses can get in. So we only have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes more. So I want to make sure to get in a few questions. And because there was some confusion about who I was going to call on, let's have uh, you gentlemen in the white shirt and then this uh, gentleman in the uh, khaki jacket. Thank you. Um, my name is Philip Pekwa from Zimbabwe. I'm running a business promotions company. Um, before I come to my question, I want to confirm what the lady was saying. In Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. we have uh, about um, more than 2 million SMEs. 86% of them are trading informally, and quite a huge number are not remitting taxes to the government, and our unemployment rate is very high. Mm -hmm. So we started by selling ICT products to companies, and realized that the products were quite a challenge, the products. So um, after we realized that it was not enough selling products, we moved into trying to sustain the systems of the companies. But then we had um, a challenge in bandwidth issues. So now we say, let's promote the whole business, starting from the business plan, the business profile, the professional resources, the promotional resources, including building the online presence. So I'm going to ask you to get to a question just so other people My question have a now is um, currently we are sustaining in the past two months 186 businesses that engage us as our partners. Mm -hmm. And now they need money from me. They need sustenance from me. Yeah. I need to sustain them. Yeah. So we're supposed to make partners, money as partners, like yeah. they so, were saying. Okay. My question now is, how do you manage a situation whereby you are supposed to find money on a concept that you are pioneering? The person who's supposed to give you money yeah. is supposed to understand it first, but its concept is new. How okay. do you manage that case? So, so I think uh, the question is, when you have a new concept, how do you get people to understand the concept? To, to give? And b before we get to answers, let's also get the other question out here so that we can get the conversation flowing. Try to keep it brief, please, so others have a chance. 
Uh, hi, my name is Yasser Shivaz and I'm from Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So basically, I'm currently running an uh, NGO to improve quality of education and reducing female dropout rate. So my question is that uh, I've heard a lot about the great opportunities that are for uh, investment. Mm -hmm. Are there also funding opportunities for uh, NGOs, like not for profit? Mm -hmm. And uh, B, is it a good idea to move from NGO model to a social enterprise self-sustainable model? Thank you. Gr great element to introduce into the conversation. We're going to move to questions questions in this area in a moment, but why don't we turn to the panel, new products and how do you get people to understand them, and social entrepreneurship. I, I can yeah. say one. Uh, so something we say is that a startup is a temporary organization in search of a business model. And what that means is that what you're faced with doing is, is you're, you have a hypothesis, a theory about something, and you're trying to get somebody to fund the experiment. And, and so the only way to do that is to infect people with your vision. You have to be able to articulate the vision in a way that moves people to that vision, makes them want to back it, and to fund the experiment. That's basically the exercise that we as entrepreneurs are going through until we get to a business model. The NGO question, I would just quickly say that uh, what, what you want to focus on, regardless of structure, is sustainability. Is there a revenue model? You can be for revenue without, for revenue without being for profit. That's what Kiva is. You can be not for, you can be not for profit and be for revenue. Sustainability is key. Anybody else want to comment on these questions? Oh. Let's move on to over here, you, sir. Actually, Scott, really quickly, because yeah. Strive was like, why aren't you talking? Um, as a nonprofit organization that is sitting up here, and we obviously, I, I started at the Institute 10 years ago when we didn't have a business model necessarily. And we are not a, you know, we, we are a still an, a, a 501c3 in the US. Um, but we did, I would say just the biggest thing is figuring out what differentiates you. I mean, what is your strength? And with us, you know, we have a great convening ability. We have certain things that we do. and using that, that's what we use then to be able to fund other research and other things we want to do. Um, so I think... I say for those non-Americans, 501c3 is an a section of the uh, Internal Revenue Code that designates uh, but, organizations as not-for-profits so you yeah. can get a charitable yes, deduction. Yeah. For so I think it's, I mean, I do think it's very <laughs> sexy and for a long time people are like, are you guys going to, you know, do this? And that doesn't, that isn't right for every NGO and so that's sort of what I would say. Great. Okay. Where, who had the mic? There you go. Hi, my name is Dale Trotman, and I'm the CEO of the eHealth startup in the Caribbean called MedRegis. The question I have to ask is, within the Caribbean, electronic health is in its infancy. Most doctors use paper from check-in to check-out. And I'm a startup within that area that's looking to bring solutions to these doctors, clinic, doctor offices, and clinics. And I'm wondering if there are any entities or individuals that look at investing in eHealth e startups that are in markets like mine, which is a developing market. Great, and let's say one more question uh, here as well. Sure. Hi, I'm Sanjay from Mauritius. Um, besides the challenges of raising capital in Africa, and in particular uh, for SMEs, we have a, an added challenge of, uh, I would say, exchange rate fluctuations and exchange rate restrictions. Any idea how to mitigate any 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 way to become to be innovative in that particular area? Great. And there was one more question, one row back. Let's just get that one to here. Yes, sir. Hello, uh, my name is Shazib. Um, I'm from Bangladesh, mm -hmm. uh, the home of microcredit, right? Okay. So yeah. I work with social businesses, but the new model that Professor Yunus has developed with the objective of charity, that is social impact, and the efficiency of regular businesses. So what I'm fighting every day is nobody wants to give money without profit. Right. When you are giving a blanket to someone, you are giving it for every year. You don't expect any profit. But when giving uh, investment for a social business, they are expecting profit. But from social businesses, we are giving back the invested amount. So give me some suggestion. How can I attract investors to invest in social businesses? Great. Three, three thought-provoking questions. E-health, foreign currency, exchange rate uh, fluctuations, and how that is a challenge. And then uh, social impact investing. Who wants to I'll hit any of I'll just make a quick comment on, on health. After the session is over, I'd be glad to talk to you about some ideas along the, those lines. 
uh, the whole area of health tech, which I think is what you were commenting on, is a very exciting area. It, at the core of it, it usually requires physicians or hospitals to change their longstanding behavior of how they do their work. Um, and that often has to work itself, itself through professional organizations. But I'd, give you, I'd be happy to talk to you and give you a few ideas about that. Great. Let, let me comment on exchange rates. Well, you know, we operate, I guess, in 17, 18 countries, and most of those have different currencies. And when I get into the office every morning, I'm told which currency is where. Hey, that's the last of my problems. Uh, we deal with political instabilities. We deal with uh, elect instabilities during elections. It's part of business. So you just have to factor it in work with it, develop your skills. It's all about developing the necessary skill sets. So we, because we work with soft currencies, we have, ex, we, you know, we spend a lot of time uh, hiring people who understand currencies until it's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I can take the, uh, the social business question. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a great question, by the way, and, I, and I've personally had this discussion and, and a bit of a debate with uh, Dr. Yunus uh, around uh, the social, so that his, his definition of social business is that it's something that does generate revenue, but then you reinvest into the business, you don't make a profit. And, and that model works well um, uh, one of two ways. One is if this, the key stakeholders are investing. So like what he did with Danon where Grameen and Danon put a million dollars in and they, they created a social business. The other way is to find um, individuals who have a commitment to what you're doing. So a couple of examples that might be useful. Uh, one, one, Omidyar Investors, Pierre Omidyar, founder of eBay, um, is, a, is a, uh, kind of one of the first impact investing. They're kind of part VC, part grants to nonprofits. Uh, uh, the other is individuals. So you think about change.org, which is a, a Corp B, a B Corp. They had a hard time raising money because investors, because uh, Ben, the founder, said, I can't guarantee an exit. Uh, and what he did is he went on a missionary uh, uh, tour with all the people that cared about what he was doing and ended up getting an unbelievable, raising $40 million from unbelievable list of folks, Richard Branson, Reed Hoffman, you know, the kind of who's who in Silicon Valley, because they were passionate enough about what he was doing. Uh, Sal Khan with Khan Academy, similarly. So it's about getting kind of people who are passionate ab uh, about, about what you're doing at an individual level can often be the way to, to solve for that. So because I don't want to discriminate against the, that very far side of the room, we'll take one very quick question, and then we're going to have to wrap up. So uh, the gentleman in the green shirt. Uh -huh. Sorry. Uh, uh, with all due respect to the lady who wanted to ask the question, yeah. uh, go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Innocent Silingi. I'm the project leads for John Deere, yeah. looking at how to bring smallholder farmers to access finance. Uh -huh. The question I have for the panel here has two faces. Uh, the first one. Very quick. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, the first one is how do you balance the growth between a fundable business model and a bankable business model? Because most of the farmers, when they come, they want funds. But once they start becoming operational, really they don't need a lot of support from me. Maybe they need a mentor to keep doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second one is reconcile that to access, ambiguity, looking at risk. And the last one, aspirational, because people want to become farmers, but it's expensive. And we, we, we'll give... Uh, Hi. Um, Ashish, oh, sorry, my name is Shamis Rojizo, and I'm a creative entrepreneur from Zimbabwe. Ashish, you spoke about mentorship and having advisors. I'm going to be a little biased. My question is actually to Strive. Um, Strive, are you mentoring um, young people in Zimbabwe who live in Zimbabwe? And are any of them business, uh, of those businesses led by women? So that's the most direct question we've gotten. So is that, uh, is that, uh, I get to answer all of them. I'm the, I'm the chairman of the Alliance for a Green Revolution for Africa, which is an organization which is dedicated to helping smallholder farmers in Africa, 400 million of them. Spend a lot of time talking about access to finance for farmers. Um, in fact, Last time I saw President Uhuru, I reminded him that I was here a few years ago, 
and we had lunch, and uh, he committed $50 million for Kenyan farmers. So I said, now you're president, can you make it 500 million? So please remind him. <laughs> so helping our smallholder farmers is critically important. Most of the smallholder farmers are women. Women and produce most of the food that makes you all look so good if you've been here in Africa today. So we need to help them. And we need to ensure that they have access not only to, uh, to finance, but they have access to uh, se uh, seeds, markets, uh, proper facilities for uh, their children, and so many other things. To your question about mentorship, you know, the substance of it is I run a Facebook page, <coughs> which has almost a million followers. Every week, I personally write to young Africans but I now get responses from young Indians and young Americans mentoring them, telling them, what more do you want me to do? You know, we, I'm mentoring you twice a week. Get to my Facebook page. Thank you. Okay. But, but just so, to add, um, Strive's going to be signing up as a Mara mentor, so you can find him there as well. So. Oh, excellent, excellent. So unfortunately, we're out of time. I mean, this has been a fantastic panel. Uh, We've heard a lot about uh, the question at hand, how to think about financing entrepreneurship based on personal experience, but also a lot of big picture views, uh, uh, aspirational uh, thinking that uh, I've been very impressed about. A couple of things that I took away, uh, there were many fantastic comments, but uh, I think one of the common themes was listen, listen to your mentors. Uh, listen to your investors, think like an investor when you're an entrepreneur, and you'll be a better uh, able to uh, answer this question of how to access financing. Listen to your business, and that should uh, be your guide. Uh, the final two things that were perhaps my favorite were is your integrity is your best form of capital. I'm going to use that again, Strive. I hope you don't mind the thing. That's fantastic. And. Um, at the end of the day, if you get into the rat race, you're still a rat. So uh, I, that's, that's definitely something I want to avoid. And I hope, based on the wisdom of our panelists, uh, all of you avoid that fate as well. So thank you, uh, Strive, uh, Mindy, Loretta, Ashish, you Julie. Know, thank you so much. As I was coming in, I met a young gentleman from Malawi. He said he follows me on Facebook, and he's just raised $200,000. There he is, Mr. Chilenje. Thank you, my brother. <laughs> so, so that's what this uh, uh, Global Entrepreneurship Summit is about, making those connections, growing your business. Uh, thank you all for being here, and fantastic panel. Thank you. My cold is not so good. <laughs>